all the other stuff that sometimes people aren't all that excited about, or aren't willing to give a dollar from the chickadee check off to help save. Yes? So the ones at the Mayo Clinic, are they monitored all the time? Yes, they are. Yep, yeah, um, the Mayo Clinic, uh, to save me in gas money right now more than anything, I usually don't make my first trip down until the middle of March or end of March to get bands read. They tell me when the birds first show up again in the spring, if they even have left. Um, but the Mayo Clinic is also a site because it's such a good site. We have a lot of birds that come through. Um, and so we may often have two or three different birds at that territory um, in a month's time. So, you, so for example, the female there the last couple of years has been an unbanded, huge Canada bird that is just meaner than anything. She's, she takes very good care of those babies. Let's just leave it at that. Before that, we had a Canada bird, an Ontario bird, had nested up on the North Shore at uh, Temperance River State Park one year. And then for some reason, she went down to nested at the Rochester Clinic for a year. And that's the farthest south a Canada bird had ever been seen. Um, now there's a little young four-year-old male there off a smokestack, and he's paired with this gigantic unbanded female. Um, some of our unbanded birds, we do try and get bands on them. We go out in the spring before nesting occurs. Um, we use a couple of different kinds of trapping mechanisms, pigeons, and what's called a bow net. Then when the bird lands, the bow comes over them and it captures them pretty safely. We get a blood sample just to add on so we can tell parentage um, who that bird might be from. It's something we can care, compare back to the other 7,000 records that we have. And so we often have a couple of times, because we have so many peregrines in the population, where there might be two males at the site right around egg laying time. Or if it's a site up on the North Shore, I'll look in April. Yeah, the birds are there, they're starting to egg lay, and I won't go back for five weeks until they get close to hatching because I've got 45 other sites to do and a full-time job. And yet I go back in April, end of May, or first part of May, and there's a completely different male on territory. So when we take blood samples from those chicks, we can run the DNA analysis to know which of the two males sired those offspring. Um, and we found out some really interesting things. We found out a male in, Saint, in Minneapolis. He is the first confirmed um, site where we had one male produce eight chicks. Four chicks at Multifood Center and four chicks at Midwest Plaza, half a block away. And typically, you'll, you may have a male two-timing, if you want to call it that, but never be successful being able to food provision for that many hungry mouths. And the chicks were about three and a half weeks uh, difference in age. So that male was sharing incubation duties, food provisioning for two females, and food provisioning for eight hungry mouths all at the same time. And that was a bird that fledged off the Maiden Rock site right down here on the river. And he, he had his work cut out for him. He up. We had always said peregrines would never tolerate another nesting pair of peregrines within three to five miles, sometimes even more. And we have five sites up on the North Shore within nine miles distance, all in state parks or private property. So if there's suitable habitat and enough prey available, they will change their behavior to whatever they need to do to make sure they're alive at the end of the day. And they are a lot more tolerant, just like wolves. We're finding wolves are denning right at Camp Ripley, just north of St. Cloud. And Dave Meach had said for years, wolves would never come that far south. They're not going to tolerate human disturbance. And they're denning right in the middle of a firing range and doing just fine. Birding and things like that. Um, but with peregrines, it almost becomes a full cap, and you can't really see that distinct mustache or malar line anymore. But the idea is that it helps with glare, because they are flying at over 200 miles an hour. If they are inaccurate at all, they usually end up dead or injured. It kind of freaked my mother out the very first time she came to my house, because I work at a zoo. I shovel animal poo and I cut up other animals to feed to birds and 
to me, it's nothing having quail in one shelf in my freezer and the ice cream on another. To my mother, that was not acceptable. She refused to eat anything in the house because of one little quail that was in a double Ziploc bag sitting underneath the ice cream tray. But she flatly refused to eat anything in my house. Um, I buy a lot of my food, my quail, dill, chicks, and mice, I buy. I raise some mice, and then I also, because I have falconry birds that hunt rabbits or pheasants or ducks, that I use the food to feed my birds. So my birds get a very, very diet. A peregrine isn't typically going to eat rabbit in the wild, but it's meat, it's got fur, he will eat it. You know, he's not going to complain that much about it. But on average, um, it's about three to five hundred dollars to feed each of my birds annually, and I have three of them. So for me, my falconry bird catching a lot of rabbits has a huge dent in my food bill um, come the end of the year. Or one of my birds I also have in a breeding project and her offspring are sold to other falconers. And I certainly am not getting rich off this. Um, it basically pays for food is all it really does. Is getting them exposed to everything they may experience in, in their captive existence. So for me, that meant getting used to the dog, overhead fans, vacuum cleaner, walking through doorways, all that kind of stuff, and being around me as much as possible. So sitting on the tall perch, unfortunately, the next morning I woke up, he was sitting on the bed on the dog, preening the dog. He had eaten his jesses. He had eaten through his jesses. And the jesses are these straps that come down from the bracelets. It's kind of like a, a leash of sorts, if you want to call it that. And then I also, for a name, I typically don't like human names for wildlife. I've always been bothered by it. But I found out Jesse James had a finger shot off. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesse James, he's eating Jess's. There's something that's kind of in this motif. And actually, I just had to give him new Jess's last night because he's eaten his third pair, or eaten through nearly his third pair. <laughs> so I think the name Jesse suits him, <laughs> but he obviously doesn't know his name at all. I'm hoping actually to lure fly him, which is something that falconers have done. If you go to the Minnesota Zoo, the bird show does a lure flying demonstration. That's what I hope to do with him, just to give him that opportunity to talk about the speed and the flight of peregrines. But with that comes risks. Peregrines are highly migratory. When I do fly him, he will have several transmitters on him. I will have several receivers with me and a car full of gas. Because I've been in the sport long enough and I have tail chased more peregrines and deer falcons than I care to remember. And people rent airplanes to get their birds back. Their birds can be hundreds of miles away in less than eight hours. Area in the state park, I could possibly fly him, but it's really gonna depend on his behavior. So the first time you fly him, are you expecting him not to come back to you? It's always a risk. There is nothing well, that... What, what would make him come back to you? Food. Okay. okay. And if something scares him, the wind comes up, another peregrine comes by, bald eagle, red tail scares him off, he's going to do what he needs to do to survive. And I run that same risk when I fly my own falconry birds. I have a newly um, captured red tail hawk. Have him two weeks. He's very close to being flown free. I've flown five, six different birds. But that first free flight still puts a pit in my stomach because of my own control issues. It's not learning to trust the bird, and it certainly is not the end of the world if he were to take off. Um, but with this bird having the limitation on his foot, I would be much more concerned about that. But to me, that's not enough not to try. If he does everything right and his training goes well and he shows me that he's responding well, I have no qualms doing it. But I, like I said, will have a friend of mine who's flown parents for many years with his transmitter, with his receiver, another car, my car, a couple of transmitters. He's going to be so loaded, so loaded down with technology <laughs> that at least I could find him for two weeks. <laughs> the battery life will last that long. Um, and if I can't get him back in two weeks, chances diminish quite a bit after that. But to me, it's still something I would like to do because I think he would do very well with it. I think his temperament, and by far, out of all the parents I've ever trained, he has been the quickest to train down and accept captive life. With people, he did his first program in less than six weeks. 
from the day I got him from the Raptor Center and brought him to a group of 60 college kids in Winona and then 100 birding people um, for a birding club. 